study uh, in in preparation for writing the book. Um, I went over every page of notes I had taken. The, the thing that really jumped out at me was um, was not the frequency of near-death or mystical states, but the frequency of these contact experiences that people reported of um, encounters with these non-material entities or beings, uh, creatures, those sorts of things, which uh, I had written down as they were describing them to me, but then I had forgotten about them. And uh, it wasn't until just last year or so when I was preparing to write the book that the frequency has made themselves, uh, you know, so obvious that I just couldn't ignore them any longer. Let's talk about the uh, frequency and then the uniformity. How frequent were these? I'd say they occurred in around one-half, maybe one-third um, to one-half of the volunteers. Hmm. And uh, we had around 60 people in the study. They got 400 doses of, of the drug over the space of a number of years and a number of research protocols. So, yeah, anywhere between maybe 35 and 45% uh, of people uh, had at least some fleeting contact uh, with these intelligent, non-material kinds of entities. Um, did they just sort of float by? Were they interacting, speaking with, observing? What, and the uniformity of these experiences, talk about that as well, if you would. Um, well, the kind of... of um, images people would report were uh, kind of repeating. A number of people described these creatures as insect-like or reptilian. Mm -hmm. um, that was probably the most common, alligators, mantises, bees, ants, um, but quite large and quite intelligent. Um, uh, n a number of people reported that um, these entities or, or these beings were extremely interested in our emotional lives, our emotional reactions and states. It almost seemed as if their non-corporeal or non-physical uh, non kind of reality precluded them having emotional responses or an emotional life. So there were oddities to them, huh? Um, well... I think we had something, or we have something uh, that they want, um, that they may have once have experienced, but couldn't any longer. Uh, remember, well, you know, um, I have to kind of pause for a moment about these descriptions. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of talking about them in a matter-of-fact sort of way, but, uh, you know, it, it took me a few years of really thinking about these reports before I attained any sort of equanimity about even thinking about them, let alone talking about them to other people. Um, you know, like I was describing, I wrote these notes down in my notebook when people were talking, but I then as quickly as I wrote them down forgot about them just because I was not expecting these reports. And even the volunteers weren't expecting these reports. Uh, um, these studies were taking place in the early 1990s when... Uh, the whole um, alien experience really wasn't that much a part of the mainstream. Um, Good point. And, uh, you know, when, as, as uh, time went on and people were reporting more and more of these experiences under DMT, I would ask them if they knew anything about UFOs or aliens or, fly, or, or uh, an identified flying objects, those sort of things. Um, if they were bringing in their own imagery and interest into the experience? Yeah, I, I was mm -hmm. curious about that. And the majority of people um, with those sort of experiences either were completely unfamiliar with any of the literature on aliens or had no interest or were quite skeptical about the whole phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, so it uh, it wasn't as if these were um, a large group of, of alien aficionados who came into the study with a set of expectations and beliefs about what they were going to experience. Right. Um, these alien contact or contact with these beings, those sort of experiences were really unexpected. And as a matter of fact, um, <clears throat> a number of volunteers were really kind of embarrassed <laughs> to, um, to start speaking about them. Mm -hmm. um, I would sit quietly and encourage them to talk, and they would kind of preface um, the remarks by saying, well, I just don't know if I want to tell you what just happened because it's just too weird. 
And I say, well, you know, that's fine. Go ahead. And they were talking about being probed and being tested and being studied and ending up in a in in um, in a in a spaceship with incredibly busy android humanoid kinds of workers kind of bustling around and taking samples and intervening and programming their brains and kind of testing things. Um, yeah, um, so they were quite embarrassed and were kind of sheepish about even describing them to us. And isn't it interesting that that's right about the time that you heard all these stories of people having these experiences just on their own? Hmm. How do, what do you make of this? How do you explain this? Um, well, in terms of learning about, um, uh, in uh, terms of the larger literature, um, I, I kind of had to. Um, I really had no interest in the phenomenon, but then as more and more of the volunteers started reporting them, then I had to, you know, I was obligated. Yeah, yeah I, I was obligated to start um, um, to learn more about the spontaneous alien encounter phenomena. And I was really impressed with the amazing similarities between the reports of all our volunteers and those of people who report spontaneous uh, spontaneous abduction experiences. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of feeling of speeding up, the feeling of a rush, uh, the feeling of really overwhelming pressure building up in the head until it almost explodes into the panorama or the phenomena under discussion. Um, uh, the incredibly powerful emotional reactions to the phenomena, the, the fear, the anxiety, the ecstasy, those sort of things. Um, so it, it seemed more and more at least plausible um, that some of the spontaneous abduction experiences may have been related to perhaps the release of DMT in, in these people, um, which kind of mimicked what was happening in our laboratory setting of large amount being given uh, to the volunteers. It's very strange. Very strange. Um, would it necessitate a huge release, and does the body do that naturally or accidentally or only in the dream state that these people were having like a lucid dream or a waking state or, you know, what some little spaceships coming by and sprinkling them with this this substance so they can go in and out? I mean, you know, you can imagine a lot of different <laughs> scenarios. Uh, you can imagine a lot of different scenarios. Um, I don't think the one about the spaceship sprinkling the TMT on people is that plausible, but, I mean, who knows? It could be. Um, you know, I've, um, in the spring of last year, I was uh, on an in uh, I was interviewed by Whitley Stryber, and uh, we really kind of batted around the whole thing of the similarity and what kind of differences occur between the reports of our, our volunteers and uh, both Stryber's experience and and uh, those of a lot of the people that he's spoken with. Um, and we kind of were thinking of a, of a spectrum of encounters with these, with these beings. Um, at one end of the spectrum is the purely um, consciousness to consciousness encounter, mm -hmm. um, which just occurs kind of mind to mind or consciousness to consciousness. And at the other end of the spectrum is the purely physical uh, encounter uh, mm -hmm. with, you know, objects and burn marks and that sort of stuff. But um, um, but uh, what probably occurs if it is a real phenomenon, which, you know, one could argue about forever, um, but if it is a real uh, phenomenon, then probably the vast majority of the encounters occur at some point between those two extremes of the poles, of pure consciousness to consciousness or physicality uh, to uh, physicality. You know, I, I think what occurred in our study uh, was probably just what I would uh, think of as the the kind of pole of pure consciousness to consciousness encounter. You know, clearly there was no physical evidence mm -hmm. of, um, you know, being manipulated. Um, there was certainly all the stuff was just occurring in our hospital room. So, um, you know, there was a complete absolute kind of lack of any physical evidence. But, uh, were the same people have, having the um, alien encounters, or did it have a smattering across the whole group? Or? Um, well, 
I'm not sure what your question is. I guess were the people who saw the uh, aliens in their DMT episodes, were they the same ones consistently or, or uh, did the whole group? Well, you said about half. I'm sorry. Half yeah, half. it was, it was okay. half the group probably. Um, you know, it was curious. There was one study in which I gave DMT a number of times one morning. Yeah. A large dose, then a half hour went by, then another large dose, then another half hour. Um, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the space of a few hours, people got four injections of DMT. And um, with a number of those volunteers, the development of the experiences kind of followed a course of closer and closer and more intimate and more intimate contact with these beings. Uh, the stories got more elaborate. Um, um, the level of interaction and communication became uh, a lot more profound. Um, so from experience to experience, at least within the course of a morning, um, the same person would just kind of um, uh, would kind of carry on from uh, one trip to the next in terms of the the the, um, the depth and the unfolding of yeah. What Mm -hmm. um, the progression and, and evolution of uh, a relationship. Boy, interesting. So they just kept coming back. You would think to the same, the same place. Yeah, um, and it would be a continuation. They would kind of build upon the previous experience. Did you follow up with the volunteers to see if they had UFO experiences or sightings or encounters on their own afterwards? You know, once introduced, did they yeah, keep coming back? Yeah, that's an interesting back? question. Uh, no. Well, well. You know, in terms of your question about, you know, about following up, yeah, I have followed up with a number of the volunteers, but uh, no in terms of whether or not they kind of opened the door for more frequent contact or spontaneous contact. I have a uh, favorite UFO researcher who says that after he was investigating this phenomenon by following up on reports that would come in, he headed the um, move on for the country of Canada for a while. Um, he said suddenly one day, the phenomenon went after him, and all sort of uh, weird things started happening. And you know, he just had to say stop, and it stopped. Uh -huh. so it was very interesting. Have you uh, had any such experience where odd things started happening to you outside the context of the experiment? Um, well, it was a pretty hard time for me. It was, it was pretty stressful. I was was giving a lot of people a lot of DMT. And I was hearing a lot of really unusual stories. People were going through some amazingly positive and kind of negative states. Mm -hmm. So um, I was going to a very intuitive body worker at the time, uh, sort of at the tail end of the research. And she kind of stopped and said to me, I'm worried about you. There seem to be these beings that are trying to become corporeal through you and through the research. And I think that it's a bad thing and you ought to stop. So, um, that would freak me out, yeah. It was a pretty funny report from her. I kind of laughed and said, oh, don't worry, but, uh, you know. Um, Did you feel like you were opening a, a door through the, the rift of consciousness? And Well, I felt like in a way I had opened Pandora's box. Yeah. Um, I had opened this kind of portal for all these people to encounter all of these experiences. And... Uh, I must admit, I was expecting a lot of mystical states and a lot of psychological kind of healing, as it were, through these studies. But um, I think we gave too big a dose of DMT. I think we just blew people right off course. And uh, they ended up in these really unexpected, unusual realms. And I wasn't expecting them. Um, I wasn't expecting these contact stories. And I was having a hard time explaining them to the volunteers and to explaining them to myself. Like, what am I doing and what is going on here is kind of like who's in charge of this work anyway. Did you um, lower the dose over time? Well, we didn't Did lower the dose, but uh, studies became a little more uh, complicated. They became a lot more pharmacologically oriented and not quite as psychologically oriented. So um, I was trying to modify the effects of DMT with other drugs, like to block its effects or to modify its effects. Um, so, um, so the doses ended up not being quite as high as a result of the, of, of the combination. Uh, of the blocking ingredient. What, what do you find that blocks, I mean, besides storing? Um, are there substances that people are ingesting on a regular basis that would tend to counteract the natural ingestion of the DMT to be counter 
attitude? Um, well, in, in our studies, um, study uh, in in preparation for writing the book, um, I went over every page of notes I had taken. The, the thing that really jumped out at me was um, was not the frequency of near death or mystical states. But the frequency of these contact experiences that people reported of um, encounters with these non-material entities or beings, uh, creatures, those sorts of things, which uh, I had written down as they were describing them to me, but then I had forgotten about them. And uh, it wasn't until just last year or so when I was preparing to write the book that the frequency you know, made themselves uh, you know, so obvious that I just couldn't ignore them any longer. Let's talk about the uh, frequency and then the uniformity. How frequent were these? I'd say they occurred in around one half, maybe one third um, to one half of the volunteers. Hmm. And uh, we had around 60 people in the study. They got 400 doses of of the drug over the space of a number of years and a number of research protocols. So yeah, anywhere between maybe 35 and 45 uh, percent of people. Uh, I've had at least some fleeting contact uh, with these intelligent, non-material kinds of entities. Um, did they just sort of float by? Were they interacting, speaking with, observing? What, and the uniformity of these experiences, talk about that as well, if you would. Um, well, the kind of, of um, images people would report were uh, kind of re emotional reactions and states. It almost seemed as if they're non-corporeal or non-physical uh, non kind of reality precluded them having emotional responses or an emotional life. So we were oddities to them, huh? Um, well, I think we had something or we have something uh, that they want, um, that they may have once have experienced but couldn't any longer. Uh, Number of well, cheating. A number of people describe these creatures as insect-like or reptilian. Mm -hmm. um, that was probably the most common: alligators, mantises, bees, ants, um, but quite large and quite intelligent. Um, uh, n a number of people reported that. Um, these entities or these beings were extremely interested in our emotional lives, 